Uh, in that, in its heyday, between 1945 and 1975, a huge state uh, which was capable, I think, of massive intervention and transformation of the economy. At its height, that state contributed something like 45% of all investment in the Mexican economy. And that's across the board, including agriculture as well as industry and services and so on. So a massive state really determining many of the rhythms of, of Mexican development. It had institutions which were supremely powerful in terms of the direction of the economy. Uh, not just the Bank of Mexico, but uh, Nacional Financiera, for example, which helped to direct uh, private capital, in many cases, into public sector projects, into national development projects. The particular trick in doing this was to require private financial institutions to either lodge their reserve requirements, their funds, with the Bank of Mexico where they had no interest at all, or to lodge them with uh, government agencies which paid bonds. Uh, interest-bearing bonds, which sold interest-bearing bonds, therefore pushing private capital into the public sector. Various strategies, as well as state ownership, were very important. At its height, Mexico had over 1,000 uh, nationalised companies. Key companies, not just in infrastructural areas either, but in major areas such as steel, uh, copper, uh, paper, cement, many, many other. Uh, these were the commanding heights of the economy in lots of ways. And they played a major role, and of course Pemex, the state-run oil company, became the largest corporation in Latin America at the time, uh, by the 1970s. The results of that status <coughs> period in Mexico, I think, were not good for all Mexicans by plenty of means. In fact, at the height of all of this, uh, at the end of this period really, in the 1970s, but after three to four decades of quite high rates of economic growth. In 1975, the World Health Organization still reckoned that 65% of Mexicans ate less than the minimum requirements for health. So it's an extremely unequal, even more unequal than Chile in that period, uh, one of the most unequal in Latin America. And in that period, that was really saying something. The Gini indices of, of inequality were extremely high. But nevertheless, on a macro level, the status policies of that period, from about the 1930s, certainly the late 1930s, until the late 1970s, had to be considered really quite successful in terms of sheer economic growth rates. In the 40-year period, roughly, Mexico's GDP rose at an annual average of about 6%, which is not stratospherically high. It's not China growth rates. But over such a long period, it's actually very rare in history. Uh, I had a look at long-term economic growth rates everywhere. Actually, Angus Madison has produced a book on economic growth rates over the, the long period of history. He does it per capita, so it's like a little different. But you know, in, in the 19th century, before 1900, only two countries in the world managed to grow a per capita annual increase in GDP of 4.5 or above for three decades. Two countries in the world managed to do it before 1900. Can you guess it over? This is the interactive part. <laughs> <laughs> now I can say I've done the interactive thing. No? Switzerland? No. Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the only two countries that managed that period of per capita economic growth. And obviously that set the, the scene for them to move in later in the 20th century in the status of the first world industrialised countries. So it's quite rare then to see Mexico growing at that kind of rate for that long period. And also it did it under <coughs> conditions of macroeconomic stability. Inflation was never more than 5% in that period. Again, which is extremely rare when you've got such an expansionary economic program and such state pump prime as Mexico was able to do. Labor productivity rose very fast. It doubled between 1940 and 1960 uh, alone. And the boom in Mexico wasn't based on economies. In fact, manufacturing became 28% uh, of GDP by the late 1970s. Now, that's around about the level of industrialised countries. In fact, it's a bit higher than the level of most industrialised countries today, which have tended to de-industrialise and move into certain kinds of services. And also, manufacturing began to play a major part in, in Mexico's exports. It went from just 3% of Mexico's exports in 1940 to over 40% by the early 1970s. So Mexico had become primarily uh, a 
uh, and a manufacturing exporting country. And again, all of this, and perhaps one of the more remarkable things about it, is that it took place under conditions of at least superficially great political stability. It may have been, as Mario Vargas said, called the perfect dictatorship throughout that long period. But nevertheless, elections had to be held in Mexico on a regular six year basis throughout that long period. The military had been marginalized. Since the 1920s, it was one of the tiny group of Latin American countries, perhaps only one other, that had been able to boast that they had not been a successful military coup. And Mexico, by the 1970s, was spending less on its military than any other country in Latin America is a portion of GDP, except Costa Rica and Panama. So this had all taken place, this Mexican miracle, as it began to be called, on the eve of the Olympics of 1968, which Mexico got as a reward for this enormous transformation. This all had taken place under quite extraordinarily uh, unusual conditions, and then came nothing. Uh, but first, for a series of reasons, in the 1970s, this came on stuff. It had to do, in large part, with major economic changes in the world, with oil prices, the fact that Mexico as an oil producer made a major gamble on oil, borrowed heavily at low interest rates in the early mid 1970s, only to find the interest rates rise stratospherically by the end of the 1970s and bring it to a massive debt crisis. So it became the first Latin American country, the first big economy to default at its debt in 1982. Then, ushering in the second period, of quite extreme, just as the status period had been an extreme period of status management of the economy, the period after 1992, after 1982, was an extreme period of neoliberalism. The 1,155, I think, uh, nationalised companies that Mexico owned by 1982 were reduced to 269 at the end of that decade. So it was a savage privatisation program. The state was cut back dramatically from uh, more than 15% of GDP, the state contribution to GDP, disappeared in the course of that decade. There were major changes to foreign investment regulations that became possible for foreign investors to buy up completely 100% of formerly state-owned companies and so on. These were, perhaps apart from Chile up under the Chicago Boys after 1973, were perhaps the most uh, savage neoliberal changes, the, most, the, the greatest U-turn in economic management anyway. Now, the results of all of that I think, again, on the surface, in some macroeconomic terms, could be seen to be quite reasonable. For a start, inflation was reduced from what had been about 80% in the 1980s to below 5%, and foreign debt problems were more or less solved throughout this process. Also, particularly after joining NAFTA in 1994, Mexico's exports more than tripled. So it became a major export, which it hadn't been before and particularly uh, with its NAFTA partners, particularly with the United States. NAFTA was also designed to attract United States foreign direct investment, and it did that very much, getting more than 500% increase in US FDI in the period from NAFTA and the year before last, uh, when the GFC, the global financial crisis, started. And most of that was in manufacturing. So many of the aims of this major turn in the direction of neoliberal reform seem to have occurred. Also, productivity in manufacturing seemed to go up very considerably. In fact, there was an 80% increase in uh, the domestic manufacturing sector. Now, there are a number of assumptions which flow from those apparent successes, which perhaps orthodox economists would draw. First, is that an increased trade and increased foreign direct investment will lead to increased economic growth rates. Second, is that a restructured economy will become a more efficient economy that some areas will disappear, the inefficient ones will disappear, there will be pain in the short term, but in the longer term, employment will increase as, as Mexico finds its areas of comparative advantage. Thirdly, but increased employment will lead to real wage rises and improved standards of living. And fourthly, the increased productivity in the foreign invested sectors of the economy, coming from all this increased foreign direct investment from the United States, would spill over into other sectors particularly of manufacturing, to domestic manufacturing generally, and Mexico would be put on that mythical escalator up towards first of all status. In fact, it's been extremely disappointing for a number of reasons. Annual per capita GDP, since the early 1990s until the global financial crisis, per capita GDP averaged only 1.6%. So Mexico has actually been one of the poorer performers of Latin America 
in this figure. Now that's partly because it's not as important a commodity producer as some of the others, but nevertheless, even by its own standards of the early period, from 1960 to 1980, it was 3.5%. So more than double the rate of growth in the earlier period than the later one. And one of the lowest growth rates in Latin America over that period. And that's particularly striking because its major trading part of the partner was the United States in a period when the United States in the 1990s was doing very well economically and drawing in Mexican imports. Uh, there are, I think, a number of reasons for this rather poor performance, which I'm going to have to go straight to. <laughs> the, the first is that Mexico, I think, essentially did what the booming economies and wrecks did not do in this latter period. Yes, they opened the markets, and yes, they did draw in foreign direct investment, but at the same time, what they removed was the state capacity to take advantage of major changes in the world economy at the time. It's interesting, one of the other areas that I studied, Korea and Taiwan, and in their periods of economic opening to the world market, they actually did the opposite. State expenditure and state spending in key centres of the economy went up at the same time as they were making export drives. And of course, China, in its restructuring, did very much the same thing. Increasing the share of the state's share of crucial sections of the economy in order to break in to world markets. Also, Mexico has done what most of Latin America has not done. We were talking about multipolarity and so on, and uh, diffusion, multi-directional uh, Latin American economies. Mexico has actually done the opposite. It's increased its dependence on the US market, so that now more than 80% of Mexico's exports go to the United States. Again, that may not be in itself a bad thing if, the, if two things were to be the case. One, if the US market was to be growing and vibrant and likely to be dependable for a long period. And secondly, if the US market wasn't so volatile. Because it's, neither of those conditions were fulfilled, what's happened is that now Mexico is extremely vulnerable to shocks in the US market. And in the GFC, the Mexican economy performed the most poor in Latin America, with a real decline in GDP of nearly 6% uh, in 2009. It recovered in 2010 to 5%, but once again, it was very vulnerable. Finally, uh, if I could say just, just one last thing. Since NAFTA took effect, there have been changes. I think the, the golden age, I suppose, for regional trade agreements, as Andres was saying, was a period earlier this century, perhaps. Um, that was possibly true a little earlier than NAFTA. It was really after about 1995 that Mexico had the greatest opportunities in NAFTA. In this century, actually, Mexico's place in NAFTA is threatened by cheaper imports from elsewhere, uh, by cheaper competitors from elsewhere. It has two advantages. One is proximity to the US market, and the other is relatively low wages. Yes, Mexico's wages are low relative to the United States, but they're not low relative to China. They're certainly not low relative to the Philippines, Vietnam, and so on. And what we're starting to see, I think, is competition from those even newer emerging areas, which may put the Mexican economic strategy under even more pressure. Market. The US market 
It doesn't have the same predominance in the world that it once had. And you get different figures, but some claim that in 1945, the US contributed 50% of world GDP across the board. Some say as low as 35%, but it's somewhere in there, between a third and a half. By 1980, it's around about a quarter, about 25%. And then there's a slower and more gentle decline over the last 30 years, but nevertheless a gentle decline. And in the context of uh, a declining share of world market, being competitive for the US market may become more and more difficult. So I think that diversification is going to be crucial. The second thing is getting rid of effectively the major leaders of state power to influence the economy that had existed in extreme forms in the early period, I think was a mistake. Uh, and no successful economy this century, really successful economy this century, which hasn't been based on purely commodity exports, has done that and done, and, done, and, and, and learned. So I think some of those levers of control may have to be put back. Uh, for example, spending on basic infrastructural questions in Mexico is a fine. Mexican state draws about 30% of its revenues from oil, from Pemex. And from taxes, it gets about half the OECD average. So it's relying quite heavily on Pemex. In fact, what it's doing is robbing Pemex the ability to reinvest. As a result, Mexico's oil reserves have dropped because oil reserves depend not just on what's down there, but how much money you spend trying to find what's down there. And as they've spent less trying to find it, it's arguable some have said that Mexico's only got seven years of oil reserves left. So, Underinvestment in a whole series of key areas, not just oil, but in infrastructural areas, in education, uh, where Mexico spends less, significantly less than many of its Latin America uh, compared to, is a major problem as well, and other infrastructural items in transport and so on. April? Um, yeah, I'm just curious about the state of uh, um, Mexican politics domestically. I was there in 2006 and there was the teacher strike in Oaxaca and of course everyone knows about the example of the uh, Zapatistas and Indigenismo in Mexico. I was just wondering um, what do you think the impact of the GFC will be on those, uh, those elements of domestic politics? Well, I think it bounced around uh, in the last few years, but I think there's a, there's a yearning in lots of ways. Well, the last presidential elections, as you know, the PRD um, and center left organization very narrowly missed out on the presidential cost, uh, and they argued that they won it. Well, Logan's open the door, the candidate argues that he actually won it, but it was certainly very, very close from there. Where things have shifted now, I think, are back to the pre. Um, back to the, you know, the traditional winners' party. All the polls are showing that the pre will win next year's presidential election. It's still a fair way to go uh, to see whether that's going to happen or not. But I think there's, there's there's a certain easy way to understand that, and that is that the pre represents partly a mythical uh, past of civility, but there's, there's an element of truth in that past of civility, and the shock of the GSC, and to a certain extent, the shock of the neoliberal reforms in the last nearly 30 years now that people have absorbed, people are looking back to that past. Ironically, even though the pre actually implemented most of in the 1980s and the 1990s, but also the drug wars. I think is obviously a major factor in Mexican politics. Uh, and again, I think there's a, you know, there's a hankering for a strong, strong hand on the, on the tiller uh, to take over and to take control of the situation, which you know, proves I'm not exactly saying how they're going to do it, uh, but nevertheless saying that they are going to do it. So there is that sense, I think, of chaos and instability that people who look back to the group, that's probably the major effect. The, the other thing is, you know, the PRD, surprisingly, has been so marginalised as a result of this, to now having you know, nearly twice the one presidential, presidential elections in the last couple of decades has uh, you know, receded into well into the third place. Just John, on that point about the drugs, this morning in the Sydney Morning Herald, there was a tiny little uh, notice that Calderon was going to go to Washington and talk to Obama about the possibility of legalizing the drug. Now, don't laugh. What if they could get a hold of that and tax it? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that would ease up the pressure on Pemex, would it? And, and a few other things. Anyway, <laughs> it might. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> yeah. 
No, well, I, I think it's a, you know, the argument's been made uh, from Mexico, and I think validly, that the demand is, or has been, in the United States, not in Mexico. Although Mexican drug usage now is building up to worrying levels. But also that the, the arms for fueling the drug wars are coming south across the border because they're so easy to, to obtain in the US at Walmart. Uh, so, yeah, those arguments have been made, but I think, frankly, uh, Obama has nowhere to move <laughs> on either of those questions, either on guns with the National Rifle Association on one side, or on drugs. So I don't think those no. policy settings are going to change the reality. You know, some of the advice being given uh, in Mexico is that Mexico should try you know, a more clever strategy of trying to divide uh, the, the drug cartels, you know, to effectively support one side against another, and to make a series of alliances because they can't be war at the same time. Exactly what emerges out of that is unclear. Peter? Um, John, I want to ask you about the manufacturing sector in Mexico and, and its sort of future trajectory. Because everything I hear, I mean, people say, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, not going to go anywhere, but it doesn't really have much chance now because of competition from other cities, including automobiles now increasing from China. Um, and so people talk about the sort of Latin Americanization of Mexico, you know, to, to rely more on primary exports. But I want to ask you what you think about that. I mean, do, you, do you see evidence for that? Well, I think there are two sectors, you know, in manufacturing in Mexico that have got to be, you've got to say, disaggregated figures. What happened in the big flow, of, the big flow in of US investment in manufacturing was a bulk of it went into uh, the Maquiladoras on the border. A smaller section went into industry further south, in the Central Valley of Mexico, and the more traditional industry. But a couple of things about both of those elements that have to be understood, I think. The money that went into the non maquiladora sector of manufacturing tended to be largely in the form of mergers and acquisitions, rather than Greenfield's investment. So with mergers and acquisitions, yes, it is investment, but it doesn't necessarily mean that new factories built and new workers are employed. And in fact, what it did mean in many cases was that while productivity in that sector went up for a period because new foreign investors wanting to get their money back, stripped jobs out of the industry and tried to find ways of getting the same output with a smaller level of employment, what happened was that there was no substantial expansion of industrial production in that section. And in fact, productivity went up as part of the 80% improvement in productivity that I mentioned part of the success of this period, but the employment in that section actually went down significantly. In the Kiladuras uh, section of manufacturing, the opposite kind of happened. Well, no productivity went up there too, but employment also went up as more people were drawn into those factories. The problem is that the assumption from increasing productivity in any sector of manufacturing is that there'll be linkages to other sections, and the back and forward will demand linkages. So either on processing the goods or producing the components to go into assembly or simply through demand of wages. What happened with the Maquiladoras is that the linkages don't work very well. About 3% of the components of the Maquiladoras are sourced from outside Mexico. So you get very few uh, backward linkages coming into the Maquiladoras section. You don't get industries being constructed backwards of the Maquiladoras. Because they're designed for export, you don't get them coming after, after production, either. And the problem is that the whole point of the Kiladoris industry, and the reason it exists there, is because it's a low wage economy. And if wages go up too much, and therefore simulating demand at a high level, then the Kiladoris is starting to be undermined as a strategy for industrialization. So I think for that reason, and also for the reason of international competition, the Kiladoris are going to stay there. They're not going to disappear overnight. But as a strategy for large-scale industrialization, there are very strict limits to how far they can go. So. One last, very quick, quick comment, quick question. Me? Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, I would like to have the chance to uh, tell you that uh, Mexico has realized that uh, we must diversify. Uh, as you know, Mexico has the largest free trade agreements uh, network in the world uh, that covers 43 countries and uh, 
also that it access to one billion access to one billion persons in the world. So uh, we try to get engaged with other countries, uh, giving that access uh, to the world. At the same time, Mexico is uh, getting together with our peers in Latin America, with our brothers, and we're in the Arco-Pacific Agreement, and we all are looking towards this region. The Pacific region, Asia-Pacific region, is very important for us. Uh, it happens almost uh, the same to us that happens to Australia and China. Uh, it, it's a very common, uh, uh, as we have 3,000 kilometers with the US, it was like very natural to have that uh, uh, trade with them, but as you have said, uh, there are many problems in the GFC and all this. So Mexico has realized that we have to see toward this region. Uh, with Australia, we accomplished last year a uh, top figure of 1.4 billion US dollars in our commerce. So it has get, gotten better because before of the GFC it was a little higher. So we're going back to the same numbers. And Mexico is number nine in uh, producing cars in the world. And we are number one exporters of refrigerators around the world too. Um, to Australia, we export uh, computers, engine pistons, and auto parts. And uh, we are working very hard along with uh, our Australian partners. Thank you. Um. Uh, look, I agree. I think I think the attempt to diversify markets has has happened. You know, there was a, a book published in 2005 um, on called the Handbook of Economic Growth, where the author did a standard regression analysis of looking at factors for economic growth, longer term economic growth, and policy settings. And what was interesting was that beyond really crazy economic policies, like complete yeah. autarky or near autarky. Actually, the precise policies didn't matter too much. What seemed to matter was a sort of a pragmatism about using the levers that were available to advance into export markets. So China, for example, breaks almost every one of the rules in the standard economic textbook uh, about exports into the world market. Yes, it opened up to the world market at a very, very large scale. But it consistently, especially before it joined the WTO, but it consistently used quotas, it used uh, subsidies, it subsidised inefficient uh, state-run companies which wouldn't survive otherwise. And then after joining the WTO, it used the big heavy tool of currency manipulation, of keeping an artificially white currency in order to get a competitive advantage the world markets. So I guess the point I'm saying is that yes, the markets can be there and the markets can be open, but actually getting into those markets doesn't require just an open door. I think that the experiences that it requires a conscious and a well-directed state involvement in the process of conquering those export markets, and that, that will be much harder to do given the, economic, the basic economic strategy of the last two or three decades. Uh, at this point, we have to, because time to keep the questions, because we have an hour-long forum that we're going to do an open round table for much more in-depth discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.